Hi, everyone. Welcome to Authors at Google. I'm Katina Johnson. I'm a manager in consumer operations, and I'm happy to introduce Nick Taylor. He's a professor of English and comparative literature at San Jose, Studi uh, at San Jose State University, and he's here to read and discuss his debut novel, The Disagreement. Uh, it's the story of John Allen Moreau, a young Virginian who must choose between family and ambition in the crucible of the American Civil War. So his novel began as a uh, uh, a project for his MFA at the University of Virginia, and he was encouraged to expand it into a novel. Um, it's extensively researched, and um, Civil War buffs and students of medical history, uh, I think, will find this particularly interesting. So one of the uh, promotional quotes um, in the cover of his book says that author Nick Taylor arrives on the literary scene as a cross between Stephen Crane and Scott Fitzgerald with the sensibility of Charles Frazier. Seductive, authentic, and unforgettable, the disagreement is an instant classic. So that's, that's a great build up. Um, and I would also be remiss if I did not highlight the fact that he's also married to our very own Jessica Taylor, um, who's a manager in consumer operations. So please welcome Nick Taylor. Thanks, Katina. Um, thanks to everyone at Google for having me here today. It's fun. As Katina mentioned, my wife works here, so uh, I've, I've tried the food before. But this time I tried kind of as a semi-employee, since I'm, I'm reading for my lunch today. So uh, as Katina mentioned, this, this book um, started as a project when I was in grad school at the University of Virginia. And I had never written any historical fiction before. Uh, I, I kind of came to this in a roundabout fashion, um, because I saw a notice for a grant for historical research projects into the history of the University of Virginia, which was started by Thomas Jefferson in 1819. First class was in 1826. It included uh, Edgar Allan Poe, among some of the other uh, senators' sons and planters' sons and things like that. Um, it, it was not at all the place of higher learning that it is today, much more of a um, frat party. So I, I tried to capture the time in, in this book and also create a, uh, a sort of language that felt 19th century but uh, was readable to the contemporary audience. So I think I'm going to read a bit from the opening of the book today. So I don't, if I've done my job correctly, I don't have to set anything up except to say that the first thing I'm going to read is the preface. Uh, the book is presented as a fake memoir which is kind of a popular genre these days. But back in the day, in the, in the late 19th century, it was fashionable for professional gentlemen, um, doctors, lawyers, politicians, uh, titans of industry, to self-publish their memoirs for posterity and, uh, and to print a whole bunch of copies and give them out to all their grandchildren and hope that um, they'd be readable. Well, I read a lot of these in my research, and they're by and large not readable. But I, I tried to um, cop the style a little bit. So this, is, this book is presented as the professional memoir of this man, Dr. John Allen Muro, looking back on, excuse me, on his medical career um, about 30 years after the Civil War. And during the war, he uh, was a student at the University of Virginia. So this is the, the preface, and then I'm going to go into the book proper. For the entertainment of my children and grandchildren, the tutelage of the next generation of Southern physicians, and the simple gratification of the curious, I have set down here an account of my life. In so doing, I find that I have dwelt chiefly on my student years at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville during our late war. Though it has become the fashion in recent times for professional men to sketch their lives for public consumption, it remains uncommon to elaborate upon one's school years. Rather, the focus is laid, naturally, on the details of a man's profession. I should argue that my case is unique. For me, the pedagogic and professional experiences existed simultaneously. Thus, I aim to describe both together herein. John A. Muro, MD, Lynchburg, Virginia, September 1st, 1895. Part one. On April 17th, 1861, I enjoyed the sensation of one whose birthday falls on Christmas. 
I woke unusually early, along with everyone in the Commonwealth of Virginia. That day, our legislature was to vote on secession, a crisis that had begun as a whisper among gossip mongers not a year prior, but had grown with the frenzy of a revival into a statewide obsession. The newspapers had for weeks detailed the debate in Richmond, from the rhetorical thrusts and parries at the State House to the curt and somber replies of Mr. Lincoln whose anointment the previous autumn so inflamed the passions of our men. As a youth of 15, I had not been involved substantially in the secession crisis, but I enjoyed the high drama of the proceedings, and I followed them with a greedy eye. Earlier that spring, my father had hosted a meal for our delegate and a dozen men of business. The ostensible purpose of the gathering had been to gauge local support for secession, but these being men of practical appetites, the talk soon turned to the prospect of war, and the demands this might place on our local mills and factories. If there is any fighting, the pompous delegate announced, it shan't continue long enough to bring any lucre the hereabouts, fellas. The Yanks know our purpose, and they know our differences, and they will respect our intentions sooner or later. The thought in Richmond, I must tell you, is that they will be too blanched to fight. The men laughed and clapped one another on the back. This I observed from the sanctuary of our kitchen where I had finished helping mother and Peg with the service and was eating my share at the kitchen table. The delegate, his name was Coggin, was distinguished by a pair of unruly snow-white eyebrows that sp sprung from his face like owl feathers. He was a consummate politician, which is to say he was given to expedient speech and lacked even a vestigial spine. The telegraph from Mr. Coggin, who was in Richmond for the vote, arrived at the Lynchburg post office just after one o'clock. I had spent the morning in the square pitching horseshoes with some other boys. Though it was a Wednesday, we had not shown our faces at school, feeling assured that a special circumstance excused us from truancy. The taverns along the square were packed with a rare noonday crowd. Like me, these citizens could not bear to wait any longer for the news that was absolutely necessary. However, decorum mandated that these men not be seen loitering with boys in the street, so they made pretenses at business and meal taking. The tavern doors could almost be seen to bulge with the swell. At the doors of the town stable, across the square from the post office, a circle of five or six Negroes gathered in idle chatter. As Wednesday was seldom a slave's day at liberty, I assumed that these had been sent by their masters to await the news and carry it back post haste. Indeed, the animals in the first stalls were ready in saddle, with reins tied quickly to the rail. Just after the one o'clock bell, the post office door swung open and the postmaster, a wasted but well-meaning old man by the name of Tad Keithley, strode out upon the top step. Those of us near enough saw his smile ablaze and we could guess the news. In truth though, no one ever questioned what the news would be. I have word from Mr. Coggin, the postmaster shouted generally, the taverns having emptied into the square so that his audience numbered well into the hundreds. The votes are in and they are 88 in favor, 55 opposed. He paused and let that little bit of silence grow like the drop of melt at the tip of an icicle. Gentlemen, we have it. God bless the unencumbered Commonwealth of Virginia. And then Keithley's eyes began to water. Indeed, all around me, grown men began to weep and embrace one another. I saw that it was not regret in their tears, but rather the opposite. With unbridled joy, men commenced to cheer and whoop and fire their pistols into the air. I hollered from a place deep between my lungs, but the crack of gunfire obscured my voice. I did not know if I was creating any sound at all. The air reeked with the acrid tang of powder. My nose filled up with the dust from the street as horses thundered out of the stable. I ran to the door of the nearest tavern to avoid being trampled. A few men remained inside the tavern, and I recognized several as business acquaintances of my father, men who had been present at our dinner with Mr. Coggin. The eldest of these, a man whose mustache puffed out over his lip like a squirrel's tail, stood up to begin a toast. I could not hear his words, but several times he brought laughter from the group and had to pause. At last, he raised a bottle of whiskey above his head. As the others cheered, the old man put the bottle to his lips and drank a 10 count. When he pulled off, a runnel of brown liquor leaked from the side of his mouth and he wiped it with his starched white cuff. Taking heed not to fall into the path of a messenger's horse, I picked my way to the other side of the square. 
beyond which I would hasten home. On Wednesdays, the street that led most directly from the square to our neighborhood was filled out with grocer's stalls. And it was in front of one of these that I was stopped by a flat hand in my chest. A white farmer obscured my path. His beard was shot through with petals from the, the spring lungwort. After a moment's consideration of my face, he lowered his hand and plunged it into a sack hanging at his side, from which he removed a yellow rose. God bless, he said, and he handed me the flower. So I could go on if you guys want, or if you have any questions, I could take those now. What do you think? Have you had your fill? No? All right, I'm going to keep going then. I haven't read this, this part publicly before, so. Chapter 2. Our home was in the Federal Hill District of Lynchburg, a neighborhood popular among the professional men of our small city. My father was in the textile trade. His mill, the Bedford Woolery, had been established some 15 years prior through a deal struck with a fellow in the War Department in Washington City. This acquaintance from my father's college days in New Jersey awarded a contract to sew uniforms for soldiers in the Mexican War. My father had no mill at that time, nor any expertise in manufacturing. In fact, he was a physician, but he was unhappy in that vocation. Keeping a roster of patients, whom he saw two mornings a week only to pay the coal bill, he assembled men and machinery for the mill, trading our family's good name for credit with the bank. As you may recall, that particular war did not last long, but the Bedford Woolery gained its footing, and other contracts followed though it has never been clear to me whether my father's continuing fortunes came from his own enterprise or from the same hidden source. In time, the mill proved profitable, and father was able to quit his medical practice. He purchased property in West Street on Federal Hill and hired men to build a modern house fit for a man of industry. It was a grand structure of three floors and a basement, encased by a wood veranda and buttressed with turrets. The family's elevated circumstances afforded our house servants, the beloved old Peg and her man Heathcliff, their own quarters in the backyard. Their cabin steamed day and night from the generous supply of coal my father provided them over no small share of whispers from the neighbors. Though my sister and I strutted the great wooden halls like Piedmont Pashas, the new house proved a disappointment to our parents. A great wooden curse, my mother called it, for once she was installed there, the Lord did not see to bless her with any more children. Thus, Parthenia and I occupied the entire third story, eight rooms, while our dear parents spread themselves about the piano nobile, piano nobile below. Mother endeavored to fill the empty bedrooms with cousins from the countries, the counties. Nearly all our relations still farmed to the family acres, hers in Appomattox County, my father's in Botetot, on the other side of the Blue Ridge. Visits to town amused them as pleasant diversions. However, all returned sooner or later to the land. Neither did the mill business pour a bottomless cup. By the end of the decade, 1859 or thereabouts, my father was forced to roll back production to one shift five days a week. This was down from two shifts every day except Sunday. The, de the, the decreased fortunes registered clearly on my father's countenance. The green eyes, so bright since he had quit doctoring, faded once again, and the creases on the forehead no longer disappeared when he relaxed. It was then that I began to loathe the vagaries of commerce. I decided privately that my father had been a fool to desert an honest profession for a life of gambling. What could one expect, after all, from an enterprise forged in conspiracy? Much of this was just youthful foolishness, but I held the central charge as truth, and I resolved to make my living as my father had in the first instance, not the second. I resolved to become a doctor. Moreover, I resolved to better my father by attending the most prestigious medical school that anyone had ever heard of, the renowned Jefferson Medical College of Philadelphia. My father had always assumed, and he had told me as such, that I would follow him to Princeton, that venerable institute which had schooled so many sons of Virginia. He had made the mistake, however, of speaking ill of the medical faculty at Princeton on many occasions during the course of his practice. The outbreaks were rare, but the young ear is like a trap for such things, and I remembered his words well. The medical men of that school have not a practical brain in their heads, he'd exhort when he realized after a complex procedure that his training had come up short once again. 
They ought to call it the faculty of guesses or the faculty of filthy lies. In, that same, in those same sermons, he praised the Philadelphia medical colleges, which were then producing, in his words, a crop of sane, witted men of science, not sorcery, clear-headed practical men, just what is needed in this field. I was at that time enrolled at the boys' preparatory school in Lynchburg in the penultimate form, where I studied Latin, Greek, and the mathematical precepts of Euclid, Descartes, Newton, etc. I expected to complete the course of study there in a year's time. Thus, my tenure in Lynchburg was on the wane, no matter how the idea upset my mother. Mother, father, I cried as I swung open the door. The vote was yes. I heard no reply, so I raced to the kitchen, where I found our peg putting up the dishes from the noon meal. I still clutched the yellow rose in my right hand. Without thinking, I thrust it under her nose. Peg was a dignified house girl, but one could see that my gift of the rose confused her. I do thank you, Marse John Allen, she said. She took a vase down and stuck the rose stem in it, adding some water from the pitcher on the counter and a pinch of sugar from the bowl. A fine birthday for you, I imagine. Where's father, I asked. Ain't seen your father since dinner. I bounded up the back stairs, taking two with each stride, and raced down the second floor hall to the door of my father's study. Putting my ear to the cool wood, I heard the distinctive creak of his chair. I knocked softly. Father, I said, I have the news. He gave a grunt, and I opened the door. The room smelled of sweet tobacco smoke. His pipe lay smoldering on the side table. He was a slight man, not more than five and a half feet, even in the riding boots he wore indoors for their lifting effect. Sir, the tally has come from Richmond, a large majority for secession. Father took up the pipe and puffed until the weed glowed in the bowl. He gave no reaction to the news. Sir, did you hear? I said. My father snapped the pipe from his mouth. I heard your news, he said. The square's bedlam, father. It was like a thunderclap when the message came, with the hollering and the pistols and what all. I searched his face for a hint of what I felt, so that we might share it together as father and son. His cool worried me. I wondered if it was wrong to feel as I did. Let us hope there's much to celebrate, he said. I will hold my applause, however. I was perplexed. If I may speak frankly, sir, I said, you must be joyed at least for the benefit of the mill. Ah, that. My father returned the pipe to his mouth. There is that. The idea of war profits did not seem to bring him much comfort, though he must have known that without a fresh line of business, the mill would surely have suffered from the cancellation of his contracts with Washington City. Do you mean to say that you side with Coggin, I said? Do you really believe there will be no fight? Are there sides to be taken? Sir, I didn't mean to suggest that. You're only trying to sort out what you've heard, which is no small task for a boy your age. It is my birthday today, sir. I'm 16 now. My father lifted his brow. So you are. He took his pipe up, puffed it again to a bright smolder, and handed it over. Well, happy birthday, son. It was the first time my father had ever passed me his pipe, and the first time I had ever smoked in his presence. The rich fog filled my mouth with a sensation of nuts and old wood. I feigned discomfort. You are not long with us then, he said. Sir, you'll be off to college in, what, a year? He chuckled at this. I've been meaning to speak with you about college, sir, I said. I had not prepared my argument as well as I might have, but I doubted there would be a better time for the discussion. Regarding Princeton, sir. Oh, you should hope indeed the fight is prompt. I don't imagine you will be allowed in New Jersey under the present circumstance. Would you believe the thought had not occurred to me? And yet it was so obvious that I chastised myself for not foreseeing it. In my elation that afternoon, I had not understood that I was cheering the demise of my ambition. I am as disappointed as you are, my father continued. You must have sensed these years that I hope for a legacy at the college. My sails hung slack. There was no point in mentioning Philadelphia. I would easier, easier attend the school of Athens. Suddenly pleased with himself, father waxed poetical. Our, pre our freedom comes at the price of sacrifice, son. Heed that I've not lost all of my medical training. I still have a keen sense of the unknown 
and of the unknowable, which is a wholly different thing. The vote today is certainly the latter, and thus we will wait and see what God brings. Yes, sir. Now go and get your sister. It is not safe for her to be out in this. What did you say it was? Bedlam. Yes, no place for a girl. He hooked his thumbs into the waistband of his trousers and leaned back in the chair, which swiveled on a neat ball bearing as well as a hinge. As he bounced gently in the chair, the squeaking of the hinge marked what seemed to be a hundred minutes of silence between us, though it couldn't have been more than 30 seconds. Son, he said eventually, do you have something more to say? No, sir, I said. I will go right away. Perhaps Coggin is right, he said. Who can say? Perhaps you will make New Jersey on time after all. I would like that very much, sir. Don't worry. This will pass one way or another. I'll stop there. Um, so it actually goes on a lot longer than they thought. Um, that, uh, this is actually true. Most people in the South thought that it would just be a few weeks and that the, the, um, the Union wouldn't care so much that they'd left and that when they saw that the Southerners actually wanted to fight, that they would just uh, give up and, and let them go. But as we all know, as we all learned in seventh grade, it, uh, it went on over four years, and it was the, the worst conflict in our history in terms of uh, life loss. So um, that said, I don't consider myself a Civil War buff or even a historian. I, I absolutely approach this material as a, a writer, first and foremost. So. Um, if you want, I can speak a little bit more about historical fiction, or if you have any questions about the book specifically, I can, I can take those. Yeah? I'll ask one. Sure. Have you gotten any, uh, uh, any Civil War buffs, yeah. Civil War fanatics to look over the text? And have they uh, found uh, anachronisms or anything? That, uh, There's this guy who writes a blog called um, The Civil War Bookshelf. His name's Andre or something like that. And, and he reads pretty much every book that comes out on the Civil War and writes a really long review. And, and he wrote this review of my book where he compared it to um, a number of 19th century authors and, and claims that I, I had um, skillfully referenced them in this book. And I had not. But uh, then at the, end of the, at the end of this very long and pretty high level literary review, he says, readers take note. There are at least two instances of, of um, military errors in this book. And I, you know, my heart seized. And he says, ignore them. <laughs> uh, it, the, you know, overall, the, the, uh, the, the book makes up for, the story makes up for it, or something like that. And I was like, whew. Because you know, Civil War buffs are known to be particularly precise and persnickety. And um, I, I've had a number of people at, at readings come up to me and uh, not really pick the book apart, but rather want to tell me about their personal involvement with the Civil War, by which I mean the research that they've done to link their ancestors to specific battles and units and things like that. And um, it's been fascinating and also kind of um, exasperating because, you know, they'll say, the guy, a guy will walk up with his son and, and say, so, so in your research, did you come across anything about the 8th Illinois? And I'll say, no, no, I, you know, I didn't. It's, it's about Virginia, and uh, it's really not about the, the fighting at all. And he said, well, you know, that just goes right over his head. And he said, well, my grandfather was at the Battle of the Crater, or, you know, my great-grandfather was at the Battle of the Crater. Uh, you know that one? I said, yeah, I did. And uh, you know, he lost an eye. And uh, it was about noon on the second day of fighting, and, you know, on and on like this. And, <laughs> and he talks about... Uh, where he was when he found this out and what sources he had used and things like this. And the more I think about it, at first I just thought it was odd and then it made perfect sense to me. His wife doesn't care. And most of his friends probably don't either. But I do, or he thinks that I do. And, and I do, you know, in as much as I, I did this kind of research too. So, you know, we're kindred spirits in that way. But it's, it's almost like being a therapist for some of these guys, you know, who come up uh, and, and want to share their their lineage and their, their genealogical research with you. Um, and that, that, was, that was a pleasant surprise, I'll say, because I was expecting exactly what you're talking about. You know, people coming up and saying, 
It says here on page 225 that he's using a Gatling 4.56-05 buckshot rifle, you know, or something like that. But you, don't you know that wasn't a breech loader, you know, or something like that? Fortunately, I didn't use much uh, military paraphernalia, and my father-in-law is a military historian, so I was able to pass the manuscript through him for any egregious uh, errors in weaponry. <laughs> so it turned out okay so far. Yes. So can you tell us a little bit about the, the research that you actually did for sure. this book? And, and I'm also very curious to hear how long it actually took you to write the book. Sure, sure. Um, well, it took me two years from the start of the research, excuse me, to, um, to when the, the, man, the first draft of the manuscript script was done. And it started out as this summer research project when I was researching not just the Civil War period, but several periods in the history of this university. Um, and most of the research I did then was in the special collections unit of the University of Virginia Library, which is a, a pretty fantastic repository of primary sources. Um, letters from students, letters to students, journals from students, journals from people in the community. Um, I have this character in here, the main love interest named Miss Lori Wigfall, and she's derived in large part from um, the journal of this, this young girl that I read. Uh, I read her journal. She was living with family on a farm just outside Charlottesville. Uh, and thankfully, uh, a benefactor of the library had paid for a typescript to be made of it because her handwriting was almost illegible. I mean, to me, it was written very small. Paper was at a, a premium back then. And um, most of those primary sources were useful for figuring out uh, the attitudes and the daily details of, of life at that time, not so much for tracing the arc of the historical record because people had a very myopic uh, understanding of what was going on. Things came, news came in, you know, it was, I often describe it as being kind of like the news ticker at the bottom of CNN headline news. You know, that kind of runs through the story because, you know, messengers are coming in and hearsay is coming in about, well, there was this battle in Maryland and. Uh, it looks like it was a big victory for our side, and then the next day, there'll kind of be a correction. You know, you see those AP stories sometimes where they correct them midday. Well, it would take more than a few hours to get the correction in. Um, but all that can be got, gotten from secondary sources, you know, what actually happened. Um, I was much more interested in misconceptions that people had at the time about what was going on and misperceptions and, um, and what they were really concerned with at the time. I mean, that girl's journal taught me that what she was really concerned with was church and what people were wearing at church and who was at church and who was not at church and who they prayed for at church and who they did not pray for at church and uh, what the preacher said and what was rumored to be going on with the preacher outside of church and you know things like this. So her, her, her life very much centered around her parish. And um, one of the decisions that I made early on in my attempt to try to make this book palatable to the 21st century reader was to kind of backpedal on a lot of that religious emphasis. If this had been a uh, legitimate, authentic 19th century memoir, it would have been uh, more overtly religious because that was um, foremost on the minds of, of most people in this country at that time. Um, so. As far as my met research method, I started with the secondary sources, like Shelby Foote's stuff about the, the Civil War, Ken Burns' film about the Civil War, um, histories of Virginia, stuff like that, to try to get my mind around what actually happened in the timeline. And then I went, once I had identified a story and what aspects of what happened I wanted to focus on, then I could dig into the secondary sources, find my characters, find their attitudes, their patterns of speech. Um, Yeah. And then the rest I just made up, you know, because it is fiction. I, I, I'm fond of the, the writer Edward P. Jones, who wrote The Known World and a number of short story collections. And um, I saw him at a reading one time, and they asked, his book takes place just before the Civil War, The Known World, in a, a made up county in Virginia. And it focuses on black slaveholders, of which there were quite a few, apparently. And, um, and so people really wanted to ask him about that and how much research he did. And, and uh, what sources he would recommend if they wanted to learn more. And he just said, 
I made it up. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Which, you know, uh, as a fiction writer, you always feel like it's your prerogative to say that, but uh, I don't know. I didn't win the Pulitzer Prize, so <laughs> I feel like Edward P. Jones has the right to say that. I'll just tread water. Good question, though. Thanks. Hey, Nick, uh, could you talk a little more about just the medium of historical fiction? And sure. Particularly, I guess what I'm interested in is, is you as a writer, um, do you find it to be constraining, or is there something that's like exciting about it? Uh, kind of curious about all yeah, aspects. Yeah. It's a really interesting question. Is historical fiction constraining because you have to adhere to the history? Or is it enlightening? Or I find it actually to be um, a wonderful choice for me, because I'm not so much interested in writing about my childhood or about my family, although uh, I do occasionally. But um, in history, I find a much richer experience and a much more varied experience. To, to write about, and uh, there, there, are, there is a school of thought in fiction that you ought to write what you know, and only what you know, and that anything else will come across as, as false and uh, contrived. I think that uh, fiction is, is an exercise in mimicry, first and foremost, and, and in storytelling, and that the, the author need not necessarily have lived everything that, that he writes about. So once you open yourself up to writing about not only imagined circumstances in this day and age, but in previous days, uh, previous times and settings, then for me it was incredibly liberating because I could, you know, as my wife would tell you, I sometimes disappeared into yester, yesteryear for a while, you know, and on long car rides I'd, you know, she'd be falling asleep and I'd say, oh, and did you know this was once an Indian road? And, you know, and we would be riding in a Conestoga wagon and our daughter would be sleeping and she would have just eaten, you know, a, a dried sow's ear or, you know, something like this. And, and, it, and it's fun to, um, for me at least, to really get in, immersed in that, in that uh, experience. We also, for the, the second year that I was writing this, after I graduated from uh, graduate school, uh, we were living in Colonial Williamsburg in Virginia, which is a living history town. Has anybody been to Colonial Williamsburg? Yeah. School trip? Family vacation? Yeah, both. <laughs> um, it, it, for those of you who haven't been there, it's a colonial village, the former capital of Virginia um, during the colonial era. And people go around dressed in, um, you know, knickers and three-cornered hats. And our daughter went to the Colonial Williamsburg YMCA daycare. And so I would often drop her off there in the morning, and the other moms and dads would be coming in in you know, leather aprons and tunics and you know, servants' bonnets and stuff like that. And they'd just say, you know, hey, John, how's it going, Corky? You know, uh, good day today? Yeah, yeah, you know, same old. And, uh, and our daughter was growing up in this place where people just rode horses down the street you know, every now and then. And uh, she believed that there were two kinds of people in the world pirates and soldiers. <laughs> and, so, uh, and then I guess us, but um, I'm not sure which we were. But so it was easy in that circumstance to, uh, to really get into it. Yeah. Now, see, where it becomes, where this question becomes much more difficult is when you get into like the, the, the Newt Gingrich school of historical fiction, which is like, what if kind of fiction? Did you know Newt Gingrich now writes historical fiction? Since he retired, retired. So, well, since he left the legislature, he um, now writes speculative historical fiction with subjects like, what if the Japanese had taken Pearl Harbor? And what if the South had won the, the Civil War? And um, so he sort of blends fact with, with uh, fancy in a, in a way that doesn't really fit the same mold that most literary historical fiction writers are going for. But the more I think about this subject, the less um, put off I am by that approach, strangely. Because I think uh, if you're reading it with that in mind, what difference does it make, really? I think I was really changed by the whole uh, James Frey fiasco of uh, A Million Little Pieces. Because at the root of it, there's this guy who wrote this memoir about drug addiction and recovery, and it turns out he wasn't really a drug addict. Um, and, but he passed it off as truth. 
I'm a fiction writer, and ultimately it's just a title. You know, if he had said a million little pieces, colon, a novel, nobody would have questioned it. But um, I, I think I'm in the minority actually there because most people, when it says a memoir, it has a particular interest to them because it's perceived as being true. So, it's going between writing and acting. Almost. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean. I have this discussion with my wife all the time because she, she believes that it's much more interesting if it's true. And I could, could care less, but um, I don't know. For, it's somehow tied into People Magazine, too. I'm not sure, sure how. What, what would be the next book you're going to write? Excuse me? What is the next book you're writing? The next book I'm writing. Well, that's a long story, Andrew Nell. Um, I'm working on a, a book about uh, the California missions. The Father Sarah was the Franciscan who established missions up and down the coast of California. But it's proving to be kind of um, dry, I guess, in a, in a way. I, I don't know if you guys know this, but 70% of the fiction market is female, uh, people who buy fiction. It might even be more than that. And in a story about priests and mis missionaries and soldiers, there are very few female characters. And so um, it, it's a tricky um, situation, to, to say the least. I think I'll probably leave it at that. I'm trying to figure out how to make it more appealing. But I also have another project that I'm working on. Um, so uh, when you're writing, um, What's, what's a rough ratio of how much time you spend uh, reading other writers um, versus you know, working on your own work? And is there any particular pattern um, of which you read based on you know, what, what you're writing? Yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. I mean, what's my method? You know, do I research first and then write, that kind of thing? It depends. I mean, with well, this book, I had a period of very intense research because I had this grant. And, and then I started writing. And then I sort of researched as I went. And thanks to you guys and Google, it is um, so much easier to, to do ad hoc research than it ever was. Obviously, the primary sources are not all scanned by Google Books yet, but they will be, maybe. And that with resources like the Oxford English Dictionary online, I read the other day that Oxford isn't going to publish the printed Oxford English Dictionary anymore. They're only going with the online version, which is incredibly useful to people who write historically or analyze historical uh, syntax and, and diction in English because it shows you not only when a word entered the language but with which meaning. So, so many times I, I would have that open on my computer while I was writing and, and uh, I would go in and see, you know, would anyone have actually said this at this time? And often I just have to strike whole paragraphs <laughs> because, you know, it, just was impossible. Nobody would have spoken that way. Would you also read fiction uh, or any type of uh, work that's not directly related you know, to the project that you're working on? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think most fiction writers and, and poets will tell you that whoever they're reading at the time, their work will tend to kind of bleed into in, Were there any specific work. influences in this one? Um, yeah, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of William Styron in here, I think. Uh, I read Confessions of Nat Turner right before I started reading this, which is a great book, much maligned and controversial, but uh, I, I enjoyed it for what it was. And, um, and also, because I was really reaching for the diction here and, and, the, and the syntax in a lot of cases, it's so far from the way I speak and think that I, I sometimes found myself trying to sound like Shakespeare, <laughs> which I sound kind of silly standing up here saying that, but you know, we all read Shakespeare we were forced to read lots of Shakespeare, right? And we internalized that, and it's in there somewhere. And if you had to go out and speak like Shakespeare for an afternoon, you could do it. And so I, that bled in sometimes as well. Also, certain song lyrics I found came out, uh, <laughs> like little phrases from pop songs. I would occasionally find myself slipping in there for, um, for like a little joke. I even, in, in one draft, made a reference to the day the music died, you know, when, when Buddy Holly and the Big Bopper and um, Richie Valens all crashed, I wrote this other preface. And I wrote that just specifically for my dad because he had, when growing up, he had always told me about that day, Nick, you know, 
it was never the same. <laughs> and it was a major event in his adolescence. And, uh, and I put that in, but the editor cut it out. So she didn't get it. So. Hmm. Or maybe she did get it and didn't think didn't it was like funny. It. <laughs> More likely. So I'm kind of interested to know in terms of the research that you started working on, um, the reception you know, from uh, the folks in the University of Virginia or Virginia, did you find anything new, um, interesting, that really hadn't been discussed before? Let's see. So far the reception from the university has been good because it's a, it's a fairly faithful account of what happened. Um, have any of you been to the University of Virginia before? It's, it's really, it's all designed by Jefferson and it sort of looks like that sort of bricks and white pillars, neoclassical feel to it. And it, the place really hangs its hat on history. I mean, you, it's unavoidable going there. If, you, if you're not into history or you're into a sort of modern aesthetic like this, you would probably not be happy there because it, you know, there are tour guides and the tour guides is a big club on campus and they're all taught the same stories about you know, when, where the honor code came from, which incidentally came from when some students went rowdy and um, shot a teacher, apparently. Um, I, so I guess what I'm saying is I didn't really uncover anything that wasn't already known. It's more a synthesis of, of known stories and replacing the emphasis on, on different aspects of, of the story rather than focusing on Jefferson, which most accounts do, and on Poe and all, all these famous alumni I sort of brought out some minor characters and, and looked into that. Also, to my knowledge, there's only one book that's been written about the university during the Civil War when it became a, a major Confederate hospital, uh, possibly the largest outside of Richmond. Most of the hospitals were in Richmond, but um, Charlottesville is about an hour away. And so it was used as a sort of overflow facility. And um, the whole campus was converted into a hospital. And so I really explored that heavily. Um, so it could be thought, I, I guess, a lot of that stuff was less well known, but not unknown. But thanks for asking. I'm wondering about the appetite for historical fiction. Is it maintaining a high level of interest in publishing? Um, and if it is, why do you think that's happening? I, well, it's hard for me to say because I'm interested in it. <laughs> but I, I think it is, and here's why. I think it's part of a larger genre that you might call escapist fiction. You know, and I would throw fantasy and science fiction in there as well. Anything that takes you out of the present time. I read this book recently called um, And Then We Came to the End by Joshua Ferris. Has anybody read that? It's got a bunch of, the hardcover has a bunch of yellow stickies on the front. It says, And Then We Came to the End. It's kind of like a novel version of that show, The Office, but really well done. Very very funny and it's sort of told in a, a it, there's a group narrator but so there's some interesting narrative um, innovation there but as I was reading it in bed at night I was thinking I don't want to be at work and I turn the page and say I don't want to be at work and turn another page and I might laugh but it'd be a joke about a guy in a cubicle and I'd say yeah, you know it's 11:30 at night and I don't want to be at work so I shut the book you know and I think Historical fiction, sci-fi, fantasy, these are antidotes to that type of thing. And in our society where you really don't have very much time to sit down and focus on a book, um, you probably don't want to be reading about the stuff that you're doing when you're not reading. You know? So I think in that way, there probably will always be some appetite for that. Now, whether people continue to be interested in minor aspects of history or different periods the way they seem to be now, I, don't, I really don't know. I mean, if it's like anything else in publishing, it'll come and go, and then it'll come back. So, I mean, there are these things in publishing they call evergreens, which are topics that always sell, which, you know, is kind of ridiculous because there is no topic that always sells. But the Civil War is one of them. World War II is one of them. Um, gosh, what are some others? Boy Wizards? I don't know. <laughs> 
uh, orphans. Old New York. Oh, you always wondered why there are so many books about New York and Old New York and even contemporary New York? Everybody who buys books, like acquires them for publishing houses, lives in New York. It's as simple as that. It took me years to figure that out, so it may not be a revelation to you, but it was to me. Much harder to sell a book about Dubuque. So. Okay. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much for, thank you. for coming out, and uh, good day to you.